Great. Hi there, everyone. I'm Liz Martin Pereira, and I am with the Union of Concerned Scientists in uh, Washington, D.C. I live in a suburb of Washington, uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Um, you could just put from the beginning. Thank you, Anthony. Just click from the beginning. There you go. Thank you so much. Great. Well, I and I, I love looking out into this crowd today because I really see a, a diversity of folks who've come out, and I'm I'm just thrilled about that. Um, could you raise your hand if you have kids? Could you raise your hand? Keep your hand raised if you have grandkids. Okay, great. And how about nieces and nephews? That should get everybody in the room. Almost. Okay. All of us. I mean, we we're talking about issues that are really real to future generations today. And um, I was very blessed to have a second child back in October. I had a, a seven, I have a seven month old now, and I have a two and a half year old. And I think, you know, my son was born in the year 2010. And when we talk about climate change and the effects of our future on, on what his life is going to be like, you know, he's gonna be 40 years old in 2050, you know? And, and those of us who have children that have either just been born or two or three years old, this is gonna be the prime of their lives. What's, good, what's this country going to be like in 2050? And um, today when I, when I present what I'm going to present, I, I want us all to keep that in mind um, because that helps keep these distant years real for all of us. Um, because we really are today making the choices that will affect what their lives are in the future. So um, just to get started, uh, many of you, I, I'm not sure if you know you know Concerned Scientists, we are a partnership, nonprofit partnership of citizens and scientists together, coming together to come up with practical environmental solutions. And um, you could be a member if you're a, a, a citizen or a scientist, and um, we welcome anyone who's interested to please visit our website. Um, and today we're going to talk about a new report that I um, wrote, and I should also say I have a Master's of Public Health. And, um, and we're going to talk about the issue of ozone pollution. And um, we heard most recently from Dr. Dockery about particulate matter. And this is another type of, of pollution that is thought of as smog primarily, what you would, might think of as smog. Um, and you know, currently millions of Americans are affected by ozone pollution. And it's one of the most harmful air pollutants and um, the question of our report is what's going to happen in the future with rising temperatures and ozone pollution? And here's the connection. Temperatures actually affect ozone. And many of us know this. If you've been you know, in the summer and you hear there's a code orange day, a code orange day means, oh, bad air quality. Um, that usually means a couple of things. It means there's high ozone levels primarily. It also means high particulate matter. That's what we're talking about. We know that usually happens in the summer, right? We, we are very accustomed to hearing that. And actually in Washington, D.C., just last week, we had three days of code orange. And that meant that daycares were not allowing the children outside. Elementary schools were not allowing their children outside to play. Soccer games were canceled because it's actually thought of that this is actually going to be a threat to their health and especially the health of children. So. Now we're going to talk about how climate change may affect that. First, let's go back and talk about what forms ozone pollution. Now, this is a graphic that was created by the Environmental Protection Agency, and it shows that nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds are two types of air pollutants that actually come together to form ground-level ozone. And they do that in the presence of heat and sunlight. So you can't actually form ground-level ozone without all of those different components combined, like ingredients almost. Um, the main sources of nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds are things like power plants, vehicles, volatile organic compounds come mostly from industrial processes. And that's what forms ozone. Now, ozone has clear public health implications. Next slide. Um, you breathe it in, you might feel a burning in your eyes, your throat, a burning and a shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing. Um, if any of you have children with asthma or know people with asthma, these are times when that might, they might be triggering an asthma attack, which is why we keep children in on those days. And it's so important to keep your children in on those days. I've talked to, to mothers who, who have children with asthma and they're watching the air quality industry every day to see whether or not they should allow their children out to play. Now, 
Um, there are vulnerable populations, which I've discussed, infants and children. They have higher breathing rates. They have uh, more impact on their entire body because of ozone levels. Seniors as well. Um, outdoor workers, people who are outside more often. Athletes and our young athletes in, in high school. Um, and low income and some minority groups are particularly vulnerable populations. Next slide. So what's the connection between ozone and climate? Here we actually have some data from Nashua, New Hampshire, which um, the Department of Environmental Services in New Hampshire was nice enough to give us. Thank you very much. And um, this shows the clear correlation, daily maximum temperature and daily maximum ozone. And you can see as temperatures go up, you're getting higher ozone levels. And that's because of that chemical reaction that I explained in my first slide. Now, now that we have looked at this correlation, what's going to happen with future climate change? Next slide. So what we did in our report was I worked with a climate scientist that we have at Union of Concerned Scientists, and we looked at temperature projections going out to the year 2020 and 2050. And we took basically the most likely scenario that the United States Global Research Change Program has actually released, saying for likely increases in temperature. For 2020, we're looking at a one to two degree increase in temperature. For 2050, in the lower scenario, we're looking at a two to four degree increase in temperature and a three to five and a half degree increase in temperature. This is based on 16 climate models. And um, it actually combines, if you want to talk about IPCC scenarios, I'm happy to do that as well. This is actually combining those scenarios. And we actually took the cautious, most likely approach. The reality is our emissions are actually, of, of global warming emissions, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, are actually at, going at a higher rate than these projections are currently showing us. So we could far surpass what these temperature projections are showing us. Next slide. Now this is a complicated slide. Um, and I worked with our climate scientists to create this, um, this slide. We basically, what we did is we, we, we basically just multiplied the increase in temperature by the climate penalty factor that we have found in the literature. We evaluated 36 studies that all evaluated the climate penalty on ozone pollution. And we found that this factor of 1.2 is actually based on 30 years of historical data and is the most likely, what we felt, climate penalty factor. Then we got a projected increase in ozone for both 2020 and 2050. Now, for 2050, we used the range of two to seven degree, two to seven parts per billion ozone increase. And for 2020, we use one and two parts per billion increase in ozone. Now, what all of you should know is that there's actually a lot of ozone out there, as we talked about. We already are having code orange days, um, especially in areas around here. And so this is an increase on top of what we already have currently. OK, next slide. So let's look at our results. In 2020, and, and this, these are results for, our, for 2020, it's a two parts per billion increase in ozone. In the United States, we calculated that there could be an additional 2.8 million occurrences of acute respiratory symptoms. There could be 950,000 additional days lost of school due to asthma. Those are days that kids are too sick to go to school. 5,100 additional infants and seniors could be hospitalized with serious breathing problems just from that two parts per billion increase. And those health impacts could cost $5.4 billion in 2020 alone. Now, in 2050, we can see that this is going to just increase. Um, an additional 11.8 million additional occurrences of acute respiratory symptoms, such as asthma attacks. Um, and 29,600 infants and seniors could be hospitalized with serious breathing problems. And the days for school loss actually go up to 4.2 million days of school loss in 2050. This is just to give us a picture of what could happen. And um, now remember, this is on top of what ozone levels are already, already level, the levels we're currently experiencing. And this is for the year 2020 and 2050 alone. So those impacts are happening every year. All right, so now let's look at what's happening in New Hampshire. Our data actually showed that from a climate penalty in 2020 for that two parts per billion increase in ozone, 
In New Hampshire, that could mean 16,000 additional serious respiratory illnesses. And these and other related impacts, such as more premature mortality, school loss days, seniors and infants hospitalized, could total more than $33 million in 2008 dollars just in the year 2020. Now, this only looked at a very small set of impacts, of health impacts that could occur. And this is still a significant <coughs> amount of money. Now, this is a map of New Hampshire on, on the left here. And the counties shaded are Miramac County, Stratford County, and I'm, I'm going to slaughter Hillsborough, Hillsborough County, Rockingham. And um, this actually shows these counties are the counties that are currently consistently in violation of EPA's um, National Ambient Air Quality Standard for ozone. So that means they're going above 75 parts per billion ozone numerous times during the summer. So what does this mean? Let's go to the next slide. Well, the American Lung Association currently came out with their state of the air report um, for 2011. And they actually gave the following counties an F, a failing grade in New Hampshire. Hillsborough, Rockingham, and Coos County all were given a failing grade. And it, what's important to recognize is that the majority of populations in New Hampshire live in those counties, which I'm sure all of you kind of know. Now, 60% of adults with asthma in the state actually live in those counties. 60, 64% of kids with asthma live in those counties. And 60% of people with chronic bronchitis and 58% of people with emphysema. So what you're looking at here are the areas where, in, in large cities, where those emissions of nitrogen oxides and bald organic compounds are actually the highest from things like driving vehicles and from power plant emissions, from industrial emissions. Those are actually also the areas where populations live and where especially the vulnerable populations live that could be impacted by this air pollution. Okay, so let's look at ozone standards a little bit more. Um, and, and currently, I want to talk a little bit more about the New Hampshire population. 53% of the New Hampshire population lives in areas that violate EPA's current 75 parts per billion ozone standard. And New Hampshire is actually in, in good company. The states that are shaded here are states that have counties that are in currently in violation of EPA's 75 parts per billion ozone standard. Now, over a year ago, a scientific advisory board was formed to reevaluate EPA 75 parts per billion standard. And they came back with a unanimous recommendation that EPA should lower that standard to the range of 60 to 70 parts per billion in order to protect seniors, children, people with existing lung problems. And now EPA is about to release a new standard. Um, it's scheduled to come out in the end of July and it could be somewhere in the range of the 60 to 70 parts per billion. And um, so we're expecting that to come out soon. Now, one, one positive thing, and you heard Dr. Dockery, Dockery talk about this, is we have the know-how and the ability to do this in this country to reduce air pollution. You saw the life expectancies go up with those, with those slides that you just saw. And EPA has actually made great strides in reducing nitrogen <coughs> oxides and volatile organic compounds. But yet we still have large portions of the country that are, are, are suffering from unhealthy air. So we need to reduce those further. And what this also shows is that climate change is going to affect that effort to reduce those emissions, especially in areas that currently don't have very warm conditions, the northern northeast, perhaps. And when conditions start to warm up, there will be more conditions favorable to forming ozone. Next slide. So climate change complicates these efforts to deal with ozone. The states and counties that are currently struggling to meet ozone standards potentially will struggle more to meet those standards. But we feel it's already basically too late to affect what's going to happen in 2020 in terms of global warming pollution because it's already emitted into the atmosphere. However, for ozone farming pollutants like nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, we can make a difference with those, which is why it's so important that EPA release this new standard and reduce the ozone standard. We also think that for 2050, we can do a whole lot better. And that's when I think back to my son. When he's 40, 
what kind of world is he going to have? Are we going to be able to reduce these pollutants and actually improve his air quality and the air quality of his children, or aren't we? So where do we go from here? Well, the good news is that the solutions to deal with ozone pollution, particulate pollution, which you just heard from Dr. Dockery, and, and, and carbon pollution that causes global warming are all the same solutions. They're solutions that we know very well. And they're solutions like biking to work, renewable energy. Um, and a lot of the things that, that you probably are doing already, turning off the lights, reducing your consumption in general, these are all things that we can do to actually reduce these pollutants. And you can do them and they actually help every single type of impact that we're looking at. So I mentioned that EPA is releasing two new rules in July. A new carbon rule as well will be rele released um, for reducing carbon emissions from power plants. Um, that's expected in mid-July. And um, there will be a new improved ozone standard coming out in the end of July. These both have to be made strong to protect public health. And we have seen some of the implications that might happen if we don't do that. Now, um, in Congress, both of those rules are actually under threat. Uh, right now, in Congress, it is a climate of no regulation is the best path forward. Um, we can't afford to protect public health. Um, there's actually a great campaign that's currently been started that's called, what your, What's Your Number? How many people will you let die from these air pollutants in order to, you know, say what you say is continuing and improving business? Now, we've seen numerous studies that have shown that business actually improves and jobs actually increase when we go forward in implementing these regulations. These plants that need to install equipment to deal with nitrogen oxide emissions, that puts people to work when they install that equipment. And we know that inherently. Regulation actually can be very good for the economy. So finally, um, I wanted to put up my contact information and please feel free to reach out to me. I um, would be happy to talk in more detail about the study that we um, performed and, and about how you can, you can also try to make a difference in the future of our kids' air quality. And um, I thank all of you. Thank you very much.